Hi there, welcome to lecture 25 of machine learning from data. And I'm going to tell you about this kernel trick. It's a fancy mechanism that allows us to, to use the nonlinear feature transform without actually visiting the nonlinear feature transform space. Okay, so that's quite magical. Okay, but before we get going, let's you know, have a quick review of you know, what we have covered so far with respect to support vector machines. And last lecture, I basically offered you evidence that you know, the maximum margin or, or a large margin is better. And you saw that it improves overfitting and you can get a bound on the out of sample error in terms of the number of support vectors. And what's interesting there is that we control the out of sample error using quantities that do not intrinsically or directly explicitly depend on the dimension. Okay. Um, we then extended the support vector machine to the non-separable data case. Okay, so it's often the case in practice that your data is not linearly separable. One approach is to tolerate error. And in order to do that, we introduced these you know, margin penetrations. For each data point, you allow you know, the data point to, to penetrate the cushion. So that becomes a soft margin. Now that's captured by these CNs. Those CNs then become parameters in the in the quadratic program, and you know when you when you solve this quadratic program with the variables b, w, and c, you end up with a soft margin separator with some data points perhaps separating the piercing the margin. Okay, now this introduces a trade-off between you know how much the data points pierce the margin, the sum of the c's, and the norm of the weights, the thickness of the margin. A trade-off between in-sample error and regularization, and that trade-off is controlled by a regularization parameter c. And it's reasonably important to choose this parameter, so you can use cross-validation to do so. The other way to tolerate non-separable data and address, you know, fitting the data, getting e in small, is to use a nonlinear feature transform. Okay. And uh, I demonstrated, you know, uh, last time the third-order uh, polynomial transform. And if you did regression for classification, it overfits like crazy. Okay. If you use the optimal hyperplane in the third order feature space, third order polynomial feature space, or the second order polynomial feature space, they give comparable fits. And that's quite miraculous. Even though the third order, third order uh, polynomial space has many more dimensions to play with. And this can be seen by the, you know, the straightforward regression for classification overfitting like hell. Okay. Even though you have many more dimensions to play with, this constraint of maximizing the margin, this regularization constraint of making you robust to, to, to input noise, you know, effectively simplifies the hypothesis. Okay. And how we see that is, you know, even though we have many more dimensions to play with, comparing the third order polynomial transform to the second order polynomial transform, what matters are the small number of support vectors that actually dictate the, the boundary. Okay. And so even though you have many dimensions, a few support vectors means that those are the parameters that control the boundary. You have a few support vectors to play with. The, the separation boundary effectively becomes simple. Okay. And this is also, you know, evidenced by the fact that, you know, we derive those uh, theorems that, you know, control the out-of-sample error, the cross-validation error, in terms of the number of support vectors, which doesn't explicitly depend on the dimensions. As long as the number of support vectors is small, the effective complexity of the hypothesis is small, you're in good shape. Okay. And this raises the possibility that we can perhaps go to larger and larger dimensions, infinite dimensions maybe. Okay. So let's see what that would entail. And let me first show you just a quick review of you know, the, the mechanics of the nonlinear transform. So you take your original data, okay. you transform it into your you know, nonlinear feature space. Okay. Then you implement the linear model there, but now we're going to implement the, 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 the optimal, the, the support vector machine, the one that maximizes the margin, or you can also tolerate error in this space. So you could do the soft margin hyperplane, but whatever your, your, your favorite linear model is, you implement that, and then you classify new data by transforming into this space, classifying here, okay, and then reporting the classification. Okay, and so that effectively produces a nonlinear uh, boundary in your original space, even though the boundary is linear in the nonlinear feature space. Now, this entire mechanics relies on taking the data, the original data, and transforming it into the you know, z-space, the feature space, and then performing your linear model there. Okay. And that is a physical constraint that would prevent us from going to huge dimensional spaces or infinite dimensional spaces, just from the computational feasibility of this process. Okay. So today, the main goal is to see how can we implement the nonlinear transform without physically transforming into the Z space. So think about what that is going to buy us. Okay. On the one hand, we see that the optimal hyperplane you know, controls you know, the generalization error, controls the overfitting, almost independently of dimensions. So we can go to higher and higher dimensions. Okay. And then if we have, 
On the other hand, a method for going to higher and higher dimensions without actually physically having to go there, without enduring the computational burden of going there, then if we combine these two, it says that we can efficiently you know, run nonlinear transforms in huge, perhaps infinite dimensional spaces. So that is going to be the miracle of today. We're going to see that it is indeed possible to, to perform the uh, learning, to, to, to use the linear model plus a nonlinear transform into an infinite dimensional space. Okay. And then the support vector machine, the optimal hyperplane, the maximum margin comes and controls overfitting. And so then that allows us to do learning in infinite dimensional spaces. That's a miracle. And in order to do that, we will see that you know we all, all we need is this very simple idea called the kernel trick. We have to massage the learning problem, the, the optimal hyperplane algorithm, a little. But at the end of the day, you know, it's this very simple idea called the kernel trick. Okay, so let's go to the board. To develop this uh, magical ability to you know be able to use the nonlinear feature transform without actually jumping into this nonlinear feature space, um, we're going to have to do some technical derivations and, and look more closely at the optimal hyperplane algorithm, this quadratic program that gave us the maximum margin hyperplane that separates the data. Okay, and uh, so for the moment we'll just focus on the separable case, and I'll show you the update when we need to do deal with non-separable data. Okay, so first. Let me show you that optimization problem, that quadratic program that gives us the optimal maximum margin hyperplane. Okay. So, you know, we, we needed to find the weights W and, uh, and the bias B. So find you know, the weights W and the bias B that minimize, you know, the norm of the weights, one half W transpose W. So minimize the norm of the weights with respect to your parameters, which are W and B, subject to, you know, subject to, fitting the data. So yn w transpose xn plus b is greater or equal to 1. And this constraint must hold for all n equals 1, 2, up to big N. Okay. And, and just by way of a summary, let me, let me note that this is a quadratic program. And, and what are the variables? What are the optimization variables? w and b. So you have d plus 1 optimization variables. Okay, and you have n constraints. So you have a constraint for each data point that says that that data point must be on the correct side of the hyperplane. And, you know, we can use the nonlinear transform and, and, and run this uh, quadratic program in the nonlinear feature space. And the problem is that, you know, you're going into a d plus one dimensional feature space and into a d plus one, if you're going into a high dimensional feature space, you'll have d plus one, whatever that dimension is, optimization variables, and that gets cumbersome. Okay, so this, is really what we're going to address today. Okay. The fact that you have d plus one uh, optimization variable. So can we do, can we actually get away with infinite dimensional, you know, quadratic programs like this? Okay, so that's the goal. Okay. And in order to get to that goal, we're going to have to transform this optimization problem. We're going to have to massage it in, into what's called the dual form. So this is, we will, we will refer to this as the primal form of this maximum margin uh, algorithm. Okay, so we have to solve this optimization problem and we'll, we'll just refer to this as the primal version. Okay, and it turns out that this optimization problem is equivalent to another optimization problem. Okay, so is equivalent to, so equivalent to another optimization problem. Okay, and this is the dual version of this optimization problem. Or the dual form. Okay, now these words are not so important, but the, the, the point to, to sort of appreciate here is we're gonna to have to massage this okay, and somehow deal with this high dimensional optimization problem if D is large. Okay. And so what is the dual version? The dual version of this optimization problem, and it looks totally different. Okay. Uh, uh, the only thing that you might be familiar with in some sense is, is the notion of Lagrange multipliers. And you, you'll see why Lagrange multipliers are, are necessary because we have inequality constraints. And whenever you have constraints, then Lagrange uh, multipliers play a role. Okay. So in the dual version, let us, let us introduce for each constraint a Lagrange multiplier. So there's alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, up to alpha n, okay, which we can you know, summarize in a vector alpha. Okay. So you can think of these as Lagrange multipliers. Now don't worry so much about 
about the notation. Okay. What I'm saying is that this optimization problem is equivalent to another optimization problem, which is minimize now with respect to these parameters. So minimize with respect to alpha. Okay. One half uh, the sum from n equal, but there are big n parameters. So the sum of it from n equal one to big n, the sum from m equals one to big n, okay, of alpha uh, n, alpha m, uh, y n, y m. So what are y n and y m? They're the same the target values in the data. X n transpose x m. So put this in parentheses. So what are x n and x m? They're the same. They're your data points. So this is the dot product between x n and x m. Okay, so minimize this quantity minus the sum of the alphas okay. subject to okay. so the Lagrange multipliers must be positive and uh, they in some sense must sum to one okay well technically speaking a signed version of that so su such that you know the sum over n alpha n y n is equal to zero and the uh, the alpha n are all non-negative Okay. So this is well, the dual version of that problem. So when you solve this problem, okay, when you solve this problem, the output is W star and B star, the optimal hyperplane. When you solve this problem, the output is alpha N star. So this is an optimization problem in these you know, apparently weird, peculiar parameters that have popped up. Well, they're not really parameters, they're optimization variables. So you solve this problem, you get a bunch of, you know, alphas that, you know, are the solution to this problem are the optimal. Okay, just like here, if you solve this, and this, it turns out, is a quadratic program. So we can write this, so this guy here can be written okay, in matrix form as alpha transpose, alpha transpose times a matrix G times alpha, okay, with the one half. Uh, minus one transpose alpha. So it is a quadratic form. Okay, and these constraints are all linear uh, inequality or equality constraints. So this constraint is subject to, so minimize this guy over alpha, subject to um, uh, y transpose alpha equals zero and alpha greater equal to zero. Okay. So this is a quadratic program. We can solve it and get alpha n star. And uh, in what sense is this equivalent to that? Okay, what that means is that if you solve this problem and get the alpha n stars, then I can give you the solution to this problem in a, a relatively easy way. Okay, and what's that easy way? Well, it turns out that when you solve this problem and get alpha n star, we can figure out what W star is. W star is equal to the sum from n equals one to big N alpha n star y n x n. Okay. Very simple. So the W star is a linear combination of your, your data points, okay? And the coefficients multiplying each data point are the optimal alphas that came out of here, the target value, and the data point vector itself. Okay, what about the optimal B star? The optimal B star is a little more complicated. B star is equal to, okay? Now you have to pick a data point, okay? And you have to pick a data point, so you have to pick an alpha whose value is strictly positive. So the alphas can be either zero or strictly positive. So pick S such that alpha star S is greater than zero. Such an S is called a support vector and we'll see why shortly. So such an S is called a support vector. Okay. And then B star is very simple. It's just Y S, the Y value for that support vector minus this, the optimal weight vector, the optimal weights W star, transpose the X, the data point XS, so the support vector data point. Okay. And so if you solve this problem, you get the alpha N stars. Okay. We can get the optimal weights W star and we can get the bias B star okay, by picking a support vector whose alpha value is positive and just constructing this quantity. That's the bias B star. So it's in that sense that this is equivalent to that, because if I can solve this, I can get a solution to that. So solving this problem essentially could be done by solving this problem. And why do we do all this? What the heck? Why do we care? Okay. Well, so let's look at this problem. Okay. What, what are the optimization variables? There's alpha. So how many are there? There are n optimization variables. So n 
optimization variables. Okay, and how many constraints do we have? Well, we have we have a very simple constraints: an inequality constraint y transpose alpha is zero, an equality constraint y transpose alpha is zero, and then very simple inequality constraints, basically a non-negativity constraint. So n plus one constraints. But these are simple constraints. Okay, what? Okay, so we did all this work. We took one quadratic programming problem and transformed it into another quadratic programming problem. Okay, and what you will see is that a number of variables here is n, whereas before it was d. So it doesn't depend on the dimension. Okay, and the number of constraints is n, which is also independent of the dimension, just like it was here, n constraint. So that's relatively similar. So what have we succeeded in doing here? We've, we've sort of exchanged d optimization variables for n optimization variables. But where is this n coming from? The n is your number of data points. It doesn't depend on the dimension of the feature transform. So it's dimension independent. Okay. So where did the dimension disappear? It appears that we have gotten rid of the dimension of the space completely from this problem. Not quite. Okay. So if you look closely, there's something in here that still de depends on the dimension. Okay. Although uh, the first thing is that you know here we have x n transpose x n the inner product. Well, that's you know you need to know x n and x m. So you need to be able to compute this inner product. Okay. So there is a indirect, implicit sort of dimension dependency here. But also the dimension re reappears when we come to, to reconstruct my weights. Okay. To reconstruct my weights, my optimal weights. Okay. I sort of expand it as a linear combination of data points, and those are living in this d-dimensional space. So the dimension does live in here, okay. but we have succeeded in getting rid of the dimension explicitly from the optimization problem. If we could somehow evaluate this dot product without going into the high-dimensional space. Okay. And then we still need to deal with, well, how about, you know, computing the optimal weights. Well, okay, why do we need the optimal weights? We need the optimal weights in order to perform the classification. So if we can get away with performing the classification without explicitly computing the optimal weights, then we will have succeeded in completely removing the dimension of the uh, space from this problem. And if we can completely remove the dimension of the space from this problem, we can go to infinite dimensions, any dimension we want. Okay. And this problem will be entirely de determined by the number of data points, not of a dimension. So that's the plan for today. And it all relies on sort of the equivalence of uh, this problem and this problem. In other words, if we solve this problem, we can solve that problem. And so since that is so stunning and it's going to allow us to move into infinite dimensions, we had better prove it. Well, the proof involves this beautiful quantity called the Lagrangian. Okay, so it's gonna appear like magic, but of course, you know, when you, when you see the logic, it's actually the logic that comes first and then the Lagrangian follows, okay? But I'm gonna present the Lagrangian first. Okay, so proof. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is introduce this thing called the Lagrangian. Okay. And, you know, if you want a mechanical prescription for in introducing the Lagrangian, you, you take the, the, the objective, the thing that you're uh, uh, trying to optimize, and for each constraint, you introduce a Lagrange multiplier, and you, you formulate the constraints in the form of something less equal to zero. Okay? You multiply by your Lagrange multipliers, okay? and you add that to the objective, and that becomes your Lagrangian. So your Lagrangian L, which is a function of your weights, W, your um, bias B, and then you introduce these Lagrange multipliers, which I talked about earlier, these alphas, okay? Okay? and the alphas are positive, non-negative, sorry. Okay. And okay, let me just introduce this function. You can argue with me, I'm defining a function. Okay. So this is one half W transpose W. Okay. Now plus for each Lagrange multiplier, sum over N equals one to big N, alpha N one minus, um, uh, y n uh, w transpose x n plus b. Okay, so that's the Lagrangian. And you will no notice that what I've done here is I've, I've put the constraint in the form something less equal to zero. So, you know, this constraint here, you know, can be written as 1 minus y n 
W transpose Xn plus B is uh, less equal to zero. Okay, and so I place that constraint in here. Why the less equal to zero? Why didn't I formulate the constraint by taking the one to the other side? That has to do with the fact that I'm requiring the alpha n's to be non-negative. Okay, now I'm going to show you okay, the, the high-level argument, not the rigorous proof, the intuition behind why. Okay, if we can optimize this guy, okay, we will have a solution to this problem. And so the idea here is that we're going to minimize this guy, minimize the Lagrangian, minimize L, with respect to our original variables, W and B, unconstrained, and simultaneously maximize L with respect to the alpha N. Okay. So it's a, it's a subtle point uh, optimization problem. So we have introduced a function, and argue with me. And I'm claiming that if we minimize this guy with respect to my original variables and maximize with respect to my Lagrange multipliers, but they must be you know, non-negative, Okay. Here's the claim. If I solve that problem, okay, I will have a solution to my original problem. Okay, the W and B that come from this uh, saddle point problem will be a solution to this problem. So, so solving this problem solves the primal problem. Okay. And so let's prove that. And I'll put this in quotes because it's not the rigorous proof. It's just a high-level intuition. Okay. So let's look at what it takes to solve this problem. So we're going to solve this problem. We're going to output you know, Ws, Bs, and alphas. Okay. And the alphas have to be positive. Now, first, let's look at the constraint. So let's look at this constraint. Okay. In order to solve this problem, I must minimize the weight subject to this constraint. Okay. So there are two situations. Either this guy you know, is less than or equal to 0, okay, or it's greater than zero. So either one minus yn w transpose xn plus b is less equal to zero, or one minus yn w transpose xn plus b is greater than zero. When I've solved the problem. Okay, so you can take every n and ask this question: is it less equal to zero or is it greater than zero? So, okay, so for each n. So let's consider the case where one minus yn. Okay. W transpose xn plus b is greater than zero. Okay. So if this is the case, remember I'm maximizing with respect to alpha n positive. Okay. So if this term is uh, positive, then alpha n 1 minus yn w transpose xn plus b okay, is positive because this term is positive and this is greater equal to zero. And I get to manipulate these guys in the optimization problem. The whole idea of an optimization problem is that I'm, get, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the alphas that perform this optimization. So if this is positive, what will be the optimal choice for the alpha n, that particular alpha n? No, no brainer. Since I'm trying to maximize L with respect to the alpha n's, I will take this guy to infinity. Okay. And the Lagrangian will attain an infinitely large value okay, because I'm trying to maximize with respect to the alpha n. And the only thing that will prevent that okay, is if this is not greater than zero. But you know what, what would sort of encourage me to set this not to be greater than zero is that you know I have competing goals. I get to choose the W's and I'm going to pick W's to minimize the Lagrangian. So I'm going to pick W and B to minimize the Lagrangian. Okay. So the goal of picking W and B is to minimize the Lagrangian, which competes with the goal of picking the alphas, which is to maximize the Lagrangian. Oh man, tug of war here. Okay. But you know, as I'm trying to optimize W and B, I will notice, uh-oh, if I set this greater than zero, I'm going to get an infinite Lagrangian. Since I want to minimize the Lagrangian with respect to W and B, I had better set this to be less than or equal to zero. Okay. Because, so in other words, the, this process of minimizing with respect to W and B, maximizing with respect to alpha, is going to result in this quantity at the optimal always being less equal to zero. Otherwise, it can never be optimal with respect to W and B because W and B is trying to minimize the Lagrangian. So at the optimal, okay, 1 minus Yn W transpose Xn plus B greater than zero will not be possible. Possible. 
because then the Lagrangian will be infinity, and so it's not optimal for minimizing with respect to W and B. Okay, so that will never happen, which means that this will never happen. So when I solve this problem, it's going to be the case that for every n, 1 minus y n w transpose x n plus b will be less than or equal to 0. So at the optimal, okay, 1 minus y n w transpose x n plus b will be uh, less or equal to 0, which implies that y n w transpose x n plus b will be greater or equal to 1, take this to the other side, but that means that when I've solved this problem and produced weights w and b, I don't even have to look at the alpha n, okay, because I, I don't technically need the alpha n's, I just want w and b. When I've solved this problem, it will be the case that the data is separated. So at the optimal of this problem, the data will be separated. Ah, so at least we see that some pieces of this original primal problem are now starting to appear. When you solve this problem, the data will be separated. Okay, and okay, so now uh, let's look more closely at this term, alpha n, 1 minus, you know, y n, w transpose x n plus b. So there are two cases. We know that this will always be the situation. So either 1 minus y n, w transpose x n uh, plus b equals 0. In which case, the contribution to this sum for that value of n, for that term, is 0. Or, 1 minus yn w transpose xn plus b is greater than 0. But, since I'm optimizing with respect to alpha n and trying to maximize okay, the quantity alpha n, 1 minus yn, oh sorry, will be less than 0. The quantity one alpha n, 1 minus yn, W transpose x n plus b will be less than zero, or less than or equal to zero, because alpha n is non-negative and this is strictly negative. Okay, so if this is strictly negative, okay, then this quantity is less equal to zero. And since I'm trying to maximize with respect to alpha, the best I can do is get it equal to zero by setting alpha n equal to zero. So this will imply that alpha n is equal to zero at the optimal. Okay. In which case Either this term is zero or that term is zero at the optimal, and so this sum is zero. Okay. So let's summarize what we have learned. And what we are about to summarize are what are called the KKT conditions. Okay. So at the optimal. Okay. So at the optimal. Okay. Alpha n, 1 minus yn. W transpose xn plus b is going to equal zero. So this means that either alpha n uh, is equal to zero. So e this means that either 1 minus yn W transpose xn plus b is equal to zero. Okay, which means that, you know, this means that yn W transpose xn plus b is equal to 1. That's exactly the support, that's exactly the vector who's on the margin. Okay, 1 is the margin. And, and beyond one is uh, strictly bigger than one. Okay, so these are the vec these are the points that end up on the margin. What we used to call support vectors. Okay, so this guy x n is a support vector vector on the margin. Okay, so either that is zero, or the other term is zero, or alpha n is equal to zero. And the Lagrange multiplier for that data point is zero. Okay. And so that data point is essentially useless, but we won't treat data points as useless. All data points are useful. Okay. All right. And at the optimal, okay, you know, the, the KKT condition that this is equal to zero means that this term is zero. And so the Lagrangian L star is equal to one half W transpose W. But what does that mean? It means that the optimal, the quantity that we have minimized with respect to W and B is exactly the quantity that we want to minimize. Okay? And we will have, therefore have minimized it with respect to W and B subject to the constraint. Because we just proved that all these constraints are valid. Okay. So at the optimal, uh, L star equals this, we'll have 
being minimized with respect to W and B. And we already proved that the constraints will be satisfied. Y and W transpose X and plus B will be greater than or equal to 1 for each, each N. We proved this, that the constraints will be 1. And we also have this additional KKT condition, which says that any constraint which is not saturated, which is not equal to 1, will have a 0 Lagrange multiplier. Wow, we proved all of that. But didn't give the rigorous proof. We just gave the high-level uh, intuition. Okay. Almost a proof. Okay. And so, essentially, okay, what we have shown is that this Lagrangian is intimately related to the original problem, in the sense that if you maximize with respect to L, and minim uh, sorry, minimize with, uh, the Lagrangian with respect to W and B, and maximize the Lagrangian with respect to the alphas, you, can, you recover a solution to the primal problem. And so all that remains is to actually perform that optimization. So let's do that. Okay. Um, so let's perform that optimization. And then we will be done with the proof. We will have the proof. Okay. It turns out that when we perform this optimization, okay, we will derive exactly this problem. So in other words, I'm now going to massage the Maximization, minimization of L, maximization of L okay, with, with respect to different sets of parameters. I'm going to prove that solving this problem is, 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 is essentially amounting to solving this problem. And so then this problem is equivalent to this problem. This problem is equivalent to that problem. Boom! This problem is equivalent to that problem. And the only thing that will remain is a few minor details to show how, how when we solve this problem and get the alpha ends, we can recover the optimal W and the optimal B. Okay? So let's prove it. Let's finish it off. Okay. So here we minimize, we're minimizing a function with respect to some variables unconstrained. We know how to do that. We set the derivative to zero. So the derivative, derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the weight is equal to. Okay, so let's take the derivative. The derivative of the quadratic term is just w. One half w squared. It's w transpose w, but so one half w squared becomes w. Okay. Plus, there's a linear term. Okay. So there's a linear term in here. So the derivative of the linear term is a derivative of a sum, is a sum of derivatives. So we take the sum of alpha n, y n, w transpose x n, that's the linear term. So the derivative is just the coefficient x n, y n, alpha n. So plus of a sum from n equals 1 to big N, alpha n, y n, x n. And we must set this derivative to zero. So this must equal zero. Okay, so let me put it. Okay, that's what the derivative is. We must set it equal to zero. So this implies that at the optimal, w will equal, oh, sorry, I, I forgot the minus sign. There's a minus sign here. There's a minus sign here. At the optimal, w will equal this quantity. The sum from n equals one to big N, alpha n, y n, x n. Let's take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to b. Okay. Well, there's not no b dependence here, so that's zero. So now we have a linear term alpha min uh, minus of alpha n y n b. Okay. So the derivative is just the coefficient alpha n y n, okay, with the minus sign. So we get minus the sum of from n equals 1 to big N alpha n y n. Okay. And we must set this derivative equal to zero. So this must equal zero, okay, which, which implies that you can you know, ignore the negative sign, which implies that sum from n equals 1 to big N, alpha n, y n equals 0. Okay? So, the stationarity conditions for minimizing the Lagrangian with respect to the unconstrained variables is that the derivative must be 0. That gives us, you know, uh, uh, equations that must be satisfied at the optimum. So, we can use these equations, plug them back into the Lagrangian. So, plug back into the Lag Lagrangian. Plug back into Lagrangian. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to verify for yourself. I'm going to do this very quickly, okay, because we don't need to focus too much on algebra, algebra, algebra. Okay, so when you plug this guy into the Lagrangian, so this is, uh, this sum is zero, okay, and this sum appears here, sum alpha n, y, n, b. The b is a constant and can be pulled out of the sum, okay, and since that sum alpha n, y, n is zero, the term with b disappears. Okay, so the Lagrangian becomes, so now we're plugging in these 
uh, requirements into the Lagrangian, it becomes a function of alpha. So the Lagrangian of alpha becomes okay, one half W transpose W. Okay, so W is this guy. So one half W transpose W. So one half W transpose W is just one half okay, this guy times transpose times itself. So the sum from n equals one to big N from m equals one to big N. Okay. Alpha n, alpha m, y n, y m, x n transpose x n. Okay, so this is this guy transpose times itself. Okay, but you have to remember that this is a sum. So when you multiply it by itself, you have to use a different summation index for the other term. Okay, and so that's why I have two summation indexes, n and m. Okay, and then I have. Uh, plus the sum of alpha n, plus the sum of alpha n, okay. minus the sum of alpha n, y n, okay, x n transpose w, minus the sum, okay, from n equals 1 to big N, alpha n, y n, um, x n transpose w. But W is just the sum over, let's, let's use the index M equals 1 to big N, alpha M, Y M, X M. Okay. So you see here, this is just minus the sum over N, the sum over M, alpha N, alpha M, Y N, Y M, X N transpose X M. We have that same sum above, alpha N, alpha M, Y N, Y M, X N transpose X M. So this sum and this sum are basically the same sum, not basically, they are the same sum. So this is one half, this is minus one, okay? So one half minus one just gives me minus one half, okay? And I don't need this term anymore. That combines both of these terms. Okay. So what have I done? No magic here. This is just technical algebra. I took the stationarity conditions for my unconstrained variables. They imply certain constraints that have to be satisfied at the optimal and plug those constraints back into the Lagrangian. Okay, this is a standard procedure when you do constraint optimization. Okay, and now I just massaged. I looked at what, I did some algebra to see what did the Lagrangian become. It becomes a function of alpha. Okay. And this function of alpha no longer has any dependence on W and B because those these, these stationarity conditions are used for, for the exact purpose of getting rid of W and B from here. Okay. And so now I need to continue by maximizing this Lagrangian with respect to alpha. That's what the goal was, to maximize. Okay, so I need to maximize this guy okay, with respect to alpha, subject to alpha is greater or equal to zero. But I also have this constraint that alpha must satisfy. Now that popped out of the you know, the stationarity condition for B. I must have this constraint that the sum from uh, N equals one to big N of uh, well, uh, alpha N, Y N must equal zero. That's this constraint. Okay, but maximizing this guy with respect to alpha is exactly the same as minimizing the negative of that guy with respect to alpha. So minimize the negative of that guy with respect to alpha minimize with respect to alpha. The negative of that guy is exactly this guy. Subject to the constraint and the non-negativity requirement on the alphas. Proved. So I've just proved, or I've just derived, that this optimization problem is essentially equivalent to the problem of, you know, minimax optimization of the Lagrangian. And we already saw that the minimax optimization of this Lagrangian is equivalent to solving the primal. End of story. Proof done. Okay. So let me erase the proof. Okay. Mm. The only thing, the minor technical detail that remains is okay. So when I solve this problem, I get the alphas. So solving this problem, solving gives the alphas, let's call them alpha n star, okay, 
So how do I recover the W's and the B's? Well, we already know W star, that was part of the stationarity condition. W star is the sum from n equals one to big N, alpha n star, y n, x n. The complication is how do we get B, B star? Because remember, when we did the derivative with respect to B, we just got a constraint on alpha that you know, the sum of alpha n, y n must be zero. Okay, that doesn't give us B. Usually, we, we plug back into those stationarity conditions to get my, un, uh, my unconstrained variables, and that's what we did for W. Okay? To get B, we have to actually look at the KKT condition. This is called the KKT condition. So if alpha is not zero, if any alpha n is not zero, let's call that a support vector S. So if alpha S is not equal to zero, so if alpha S is strictly positive, okay, then what do we know? Then we know that uh, this term is zero. So Y S uh, W star transpose X S plus B is equal to one. So this guy is a support vector on the cushion. And if this is satisfied, well, we know W star now. We've just computed it. Multiply both sides by Ys. Since Ys is plus or minus 1, Ys squared is 1. And so we get that W star transpose Xs plus B is equal to Ys. Multiply both sides by uh, Ys. Okay. That tells me that B is equal to Ys minus W star transpose Xs. Bam. Bam. So you've solved this problem and gotten the alpha stars, and now I do a few manipulations, and I can get my optimal W star and my optimal B. Okay, so let's erase the proof. So this is just the proof of the equivalence. And as usual, when we do a technical der derivation, let me now come and wake up. Okay, because sometimes you don't are not interested in the technical derivation. You know, so I personally do not believe results unless I see the technical derivation. Okay, so if you fell asleep for the technical derivation, it's now time to wake up. Okay, and you know, listen to the summary. The summary is that the primal problem and the dual problem are equivalent. If we can solve the dual problem, we get a solution to the primal problem. We're going to focus on the dual problem and see how that allows us to go to infinite dimensional spaces. And that's magic. So it's worth waking up for. But before we do that, let, let's, uh, you know, do an example in the dual, dual version of the problem and, and, and sort of uh, just see that, you know, yes, indeed, things work. And uh, then we will link this dual problem to being able to move into infinite dimensional spaces without any computational issues. Okay. And that's the main goal of today. The miracle of the day. Learning in infinite dimensional spaces. Wow! Okay, so I've reproduced here the example that we solved last time when we derived the optimal hyperplane. So we have these data points, okay, and you know this is 0, 0, this is 2, 2, and those are both uh, negative, red x's, and, and this is 2, 0, and 3, 0, and those are both positive. So minus one, minus one, plus one, plus one, okay? And you know, last time and in general, the signed data matrix is also a useful matrix where you take each of your data points and multiply by the corresponding y value, okay? So the signed data matrix is zero, minus two here because the y's are minus one, and then two, zero, three, zero, okay? So that's the example that we solved, you know, when we, when we derived the primal problem and we saw before that the optimal hyperplane that gets the maximum margin you know, satisfies the, the equation x1 minus x2 minus 1 equals 0, okay? So now, let's get that same solution, just as, a, as an example, using the dual problem, okay? And, you know, when you formulate this dual problem in this uh, matrix form, okay, so it looks like a quadratic program, so let me remind you what the general quadratic program, so a quadratic program, okay, so what is that? That's, you know, minimize, or your optimization variable u, which is a q-dimensional optimization variable of u transpose q u plus p transpose uh, u, subject to a u uh, a u is uh, greater or equal to zero. Okay, so now you know um, in 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 our example, you know um, uh, q is g, and the components, the m n component of g, has to be you know, the nm component is yn, ym, xn transpose xn. Okay. So uh, it turns out that if you work it out, so this is x sub s. Okay, so x sub s, x sub s 
transpose the nm component where x sub s is is the matrix that's formed by y1 x1 transpose y2 x2 transpose okay and so on uh, y n x n transpose okay so if i do x s x s transpose okay so what is that this is uh xs which is y1 x1 transpose y2 x2 transpose all the way to yn xn transpose times its transpose so that's y1 x1 y uh, uh, 2x2 to yn xn okay so if I want the nm component, I take the nth row here. So I take the nth row here and the mth column here. Okay. And I multiply this nth row with that mth column. I have, I, I have here uh, yn xn transpose. Here I have ym xm. So this is yn ym xn transpose xn, which is exactly this term. So if I call this matrix, I call this G and M, then G is exactly the matrix XS, XS transpose. Okay. So in this formulation, the, the, the quadratic form, the matrix that in, it is involved in the quadratic part of this objective is exactly XS, XS transpose. Okay. So this is Q. So mapping this form to the standard form of a quadratic program, Q is equals to X, the signed data matrix X, S transpose. What is P? So that's the linear term. So the linear term is, is minus one transpose. So P is minus one transpose. Okay. Uh, sorry, in the general form, this can be greater equal to C. Okay. And what is A? So A involves our constraints. So the rows of A is uh, determined by our constraint. So the first row of A, well, this is not an inequality, con this is an inequality constraint. So this is an inequality constraint. This is an equality constraint. An equality constraint is equivalent to Y. So this guy here, Y transpose X, Y transpose alpha equals zero is equivalent to Y transpose alpha greater equal to zero and um, Y transpose alpha less equal to zero. Okay. Those two combined give you equals to zero. But Y transpose alpha less equal to zero is the same as minus Y transpose alpha greater or equal to zero. Okay. So an equality constraint becomes two inequality constraints. And then alpha greater or equal to zero is the same as I alpha greater or equal to zero. So this matrix A, so we can define, we can identify the matrix A as Y transpose minus Y transpose, the identity N by N. So that's the matrix A. And the vector C, well, the vector C uh, is just all zeros. So C is just zero, zero, and the n dimensional zero. Okay. So here, for the quadratic program in vector form that's equivalent to the quadratic program we need to solve, we can identify the parameters Q, P, A, and C. Q, P, A, and C. So if you send this in, you send this in to your quadratic programming algorithm, Q of uh, QP of uh, Q, P, A, and C. It's going to output U star, U star, which in our case is just alpha star, which is alpha star. Okay. And if you plug in these matrices, so Q is equal to this trans, this, this matrix times its transpose. P is the negative ve uh, vector of all ones. A is you know, y, where y is here, okay. minus y, so as a row, and then the identity, and c is all zeros, you end up with alpha equals to one half, one half, one, zero. Okay. So solving the dual problem using a quadratic program assigns alpha equals one half, alpha equals one half, alpha equals one half, alpha equals one, alpha equals zero. Okay. And now we're ready to get our weights and our bias. Okay, using this formula. Okay, so, erase. Now that we've gotten our optimal alpha star, we don't need anything else. Okay, we've solved the problem. All we need is the alpha star. And so this implies that our weights, W star, is, you know, the sum over my Lagrange multipliers, alpha n star, 
uh, yn xn, which is equal to one half. Okay, so that's alpha n. So yn is minus one dot minus one. Xn is just zero. Okay, plus one half. Yn is minus one. Xn is two two. Uh, plus alpha n is one. Yn is plus one, and Xn is two zero. Plus alpha n is zero. Okay, times yn, which is plus one times three zero, but zero just gives me zero. So this is just one half uh, minus one half two two. Uh, plus two zero, which is minus one plus two, which is one minus one. So those are my optimal weights. We can pick uh, a positive alpha, a support vector. So pick a positive alpha, pick a support vector to get my bias. So B star, we can pick the positive uh, uh, Lagrange multiplier alpha one is equal to Y one, so minus one. Minus my optimal weights, 1, 1 transpose times the vector, which is 0, 0. So minus 1 minus 1 times 0, 0. Which in this case, because this is 0, 0, that just gives me 0, 0. So this is just minus 1. So my classifier, G of X, is equal to W star X, which is X1 minus X2, sine of W star X, which is X1 minus X2, plus B star minus one, exactly what we got before. Okay. Now, I highly encourage you to work by hand through this example, plug it into the quadratic program, get one half, one half, one zero, okay. obtain your optimal weights and bias, obtain your optimal weights and bias, and convince yourself that this dual version of the, uh, of the problem is exactly analogous in the sense that is equivalent to, in the sense that if I solve this, I can get the solution to the primal form. Convince yourself with this small example. Just do it. Do it by hand. Okay? And that essentially is the algorithm for solving the optimal hyperplane problem in the dual version. Now, I'm going to erase and show you why this is magical. Why this is relevant to be able to run, you know, the nonlinear transform in infinite dimensional spaces. Okay, so now let's get back to the both the primal and the dual version, and let's see what happens when you solve the primal or the dual version. How do you classify? What's your final classifier? Okay. In the primal version, the final classifier is very easy. So the final classifier, final classifier, g of x is just equal to the sine of w star transpose x plus b star. Okay, so you solve this problem, you get W star, B star, it's the sign. Okay. You can do the same thing here. You can solve this problem, you can get W star, B star, and you can plug it into that final hypothesis, exactly the same. Okay. But now we're going to address the issue of trying to get rid of all dependence on dimension, all dependence on the actual feature vectors. Okay. Uh, and with a view towards the fact that these feature vectors, X and, uh, X and XM, for example, and XN here, when we transform to a, a, a nonlinear feature space, those become Zs. Okay? And if that nonlinear feature space is very huge dimensional, then these are unwieldy vectors, and we'd like to get rid of dependence on them. Okay? And so the first thing we will observe is that, well, we, we, we have a functional form for W star. So we, let's look at what this function looks like. Okay? So when we plug it in, so now we can get rid of this uh, so when we plug this in, we get that our final hypothesis, g of x, is equal to, it's the same, it's the sine of w star x, trans, w star transpose x plus b, but now we know what w star is and we know what b is. So it's the sine of this guy transpose, so the sum from n equals 1 to big N, alpha n star to yn, xn, and we take the transpose, so transpose, times x, put this in parentheses, okay, plus b star. Okay. What, but what is b star? So plus, okay, plus a b star. Okay. But what is b star? So b star, it's just a number. So that doesn't depend on dimension. It's just a single number. It's b star is equal to ys 
minus, okay, so W star, but we know what W star is, minus the sum over your data points, alpha n star, or y n, x n transpose, so W transpose, x s, where x s is a support vector. So you can compute this B star, okay, and now you see that <coughs> I've entirely represented the final hypothesis using just my support, uh, my, my Lagrange multipliers at the optimal, okay, my target values, and my data points. Okay? So this entirely depends, entirely depends on alpha and star. Yn and x, the x values, so xn and x, okay, so xn and x. Okay. But it doesn't depend in an arbitrary way on my xn and x's. Okay. So let's look at the computation of B star. The computation of B star only involves the dot product xn dot product xs. Okay, so it only depends on xn dot product xs okay. and xn dot product x xn dot product x okay. so my final hypothesis only depends on dot products okay. um, you might have observed a small issue with this final hypothesis if i represent the final hypothesis in this way without actually computing w star and b star Okay. Then, in order to deploy my final hypothesis, I need to have all my data points. And it seems like I'm end ending up in the same situation as I was when we talked about the nearest neighbor algorithm. When you want to deploy, you have to use all your data. Hmm. Well, it turns out, and as you saw in that example, that you know very often many of these alpha n's are zero. So you only really need to keep the data points which are support vectors. Actually, you can compute the B star, you know, uh, as one number, okay, but in order to deploy your final hypothesis, you only need the, the terms in this summation which are non-zero, which correspond to support vectors, the alpha n's which are non-zero. And that's a huge savings, a huge improvement over, for example, the nearest neighbor computational demand of having to carry around all the data with you. Okay, so that's a huge savings. Even though it looks like we have to carry around all the data, we don't. Just pointing that out because many of you might have observed, wow, so we have to carry around all our data to classify? No, only the support vectors. And usually there are very few support vectors. Okay, now, so let's get back to this main observation that the dependence on this final hypothesis on the data is only through dot products. And then I'll make one more observation. If we look at how we got the optimal alphas, we solved an optimization problem. What does this optimization problem depend on? Well, it, uh, you've got your optimization variable alpha, and then the parameters that you have to uh, send in are the target values yn and the data xn and x. But you don't need to send in the data. You only need to send in this matrix g and n. Okay. So to get the alpha n star, we only need the matrix g, i.e. g n m, which is xn transpose xm or xn dotted into xm. This is what we need in order to get the alpha n star. And you will observe that again, all I need are dot products. Or specifically this matrix G. This matrix G is sometimes called the gram matrix, the matrix of dot products. Okay. Um, well, technically, we define the matrix as the signed grand matrix that also involves the y's. But if you give me the matrix of dot products, which is what conventionally is called the grand matrix, I have enough, all the information I need because I also have the y value. So this is an n by n matrix. So this is an n by n matrix. This is the target value is n by 1 matrix of dot products. Okay, The target vector is n by 1 vector of uh, target values and these together allow me to get uh, alpha n star. Alpha n star gives me, you know, um, the ability to compute the final hypothesis g and in order to compute the final hypothesis g, well I've computed b star using just dot products 
Okay, so these terms are already in this gram matrix. And I need the ability to compute the dot product between my test x and my data points, my support vectors. Okay. So the entire algorithm depends only on the ability to compute dot products. Okay. And such algorithms are called inner product algorithms. Well, the dot product is called an inner product. So such algorithms are called inner product algorithms. Okay. These are very convenient algorithms. Because in order for this entire algorithm to run, so in order for us to be able to run the entire you know, optimal maximum margin hyperplane algorithm. In order to run this entire algorithm, all we need is the ability to compute dot products. You don't even need to give me the data. If you give me a function that can take as, as inputs, you know, data points and spits out the dot product, that's all I need to uh, run this optimal hyperplane algorithm. So let me show you how. So supposing you gave me a function, give me a function. And I'm going to call this function k. And it takes as two arguments, you know, one vector and another vector. Okay, k of two arguments. Let's call it x and x prime. And it returns x dot x prime. Okay. We call this a kernel. We call this a kernel. Okay. Then I can run the entire optimal hyperplane algorithm. Here's how. The optimization problem, minimize over uh, alpha, one half the sum over n and m, alpha n, alpha m, y n, y m, my kernel on x n and x m, okay. minus the sum over n alpha n. Okay. So that's the objective. Subject to uh, sum over n alpha n y n equals zero and alpha n uh, is uh, greater or equal to zero. This gives me alpha n star. Okay. <clears throat> Once I have alpha n star, my final hypothesis g of x is equal to the sine of the sum over n to big N. Alpha n star yn, my kernel of xn and x, okay, plus b star, where b star is just equal to ys okay, minus the sum from n equals 1 to big N, of alpha n, yn, my kernel of xn and xs, where xs is a support vector. A support vector, which means alpha s is bigger than c. Boom! I've represented this entire algorithm and the final hypothesis using what? Using just the ability to compute dot products. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> and this dot product is just the dot product in whatever space you're in. Okay, so now let's look at what happens. So let me erase this. So such algorithms are called inner product algorithms. By the way, everything I'm about to discuss now applies to any inner product algorithm, an algorithm that only needs the ability to compute dot products. And it turns out, and that's another beauty of the optimal hyperplane algorithm, it's an algorithm that only needs inner products, that only needs dot products, inner product algorithm. So now let's see. Oops. So now let's see what happens when I transform into a feature space. So if I transform into a feature space, my z, my x's go to z1, z2, up to zn. Okay, and my y's remain the same. Okay, nothing happens to the y values. The x values totally changed because that's what gets transformed. Okay. And in order to run this algorithm in my z space, I need to compute dot products, need to compute, need to compute dot product. Okay, z 
n, let's say for example, zn transpose uh, zm, if I have two data points, or zn transpose x, okay, uh, sorry, z, if I have a data point, uh, a data point and a test point. Okay, so I need to compute dot products. Now, typically I would transform into that space and just compute the dot product in the simple, usual, you know, Euclidean dot product way. Okay, and the question we're going to ask is, is it possible to compute this dot product in my Z space and therefore run this entire algorithm without actually going into the Z space? Question. Is it possible to compute the dot product in the Z space without physically transforming to the Z space? If we can, okay. Then we can run this algorithm because all it needs are the dot products. If I replace this entire algorithm with z instead of instead of x, okay, all I need are the dot products in my z space. Okay. So if I if I replace this entire algorithm with z's, then this is basically supposed to be z n transpose z n. This is supposed to be z n transpose z and this is supposed to be zn transpose zs. So and as it is illustrated here, okay, one way to compute that is to actually physically transform into the z space and compute these dot products. Another way to compute them is maybe you know give me a function that takes as input xn and xm and somehow magically produces zn transpose zm. Give me a function that would take as input xn and x and somehow magically produces zn transpose z. Similar here. If you could give me this function that can take xn and xm and produce the dot product in my z space, I can run this entire algorithm completely in my x space. And now, that's the punchline. I'm going to show you how we can construct kernels that compute dot products in nonlinear feature transform spaces without actually going there. So they take as inputs the, the actual vectors in your original space and re return the dot product in your nonlinear feature transform space. If I can do that, I can run this algorithm in pretending as if I'm in that space. And I even have the final classifier pretending as if I'm in that space. But I never had to go to that space. Okay. So let's do a couple of examples to show you that I can indeed compute this dot product in my nonlinear transform space without actually visiting there by suitably constructing the kernel. We'll start with a simple example where the transform is polynomial and then we'll do an example where the transform is to an infinite dimensional space where it's not possible to go to that space, but we can still construct a kernel that gives us the dot product in that space, which is then a miracle. Because then we can run this algorithm in that infinite dimensional space using that dot product, that kernel. Okay. We'll do two examples. The first is this, a simple, you know, nonlinear transform, the second order polynomial transform to show you how we can compute the dot products in the feature space without ever going there. And then the miracle of the day. Uh, how can we com com compute dot products for a transform that takes us to an infinite dimensional space? That allows us to do learning in infinite dimensions. Wow. That is superpower. <clears throat> okay, so example. So the simple example first. Okay, second order polynomial transform. So we have x, it's intensity symmetry, let's say so two dimensional x, x1, x2. Okay, and that goes to z, which is. Uh, x1, x2, x1 squared, x1, x2, x2 squared. And I'm going to put a square root of 2 here. So it's the standard polynomial transform. It doesn't affect the polynomial transform. It just makes the algebra more convenient. Okay. 
Now, if I'm going to run my optimal hyperplane algorithm in my Z space to do the uh, uh, maximum margin linear separator, then, um, um, then I need to be able to compute the dot products in my Z space. So I need to be able to compute uh, Z dot Z prime for any two vectors in my Z space, Z and Z prime. Well, what are these? This is just phi of X transpose phi of X prime. So I need to be able to compute phi of x, phi of x prime. So let's look at a second data point, x prime, which is x1 prime, x2 prime. Okay, so this transforms to z prime, which is uh, x1 prime, x2 prime, x1 prime squared, square root of 2, x1 prime, x2 prime, and then x2 prime uh, squared. So if I take the dot product of these two, z dot z prime is just exactly equal to x1, x1 prime, so x1, x1 prime, plus x2, x2 prime, x2, x2 prime, plus x1 squared, x1 prime squared, plus x1 squared, x1 prime squared, okay, plus x2 squared, x2 prime squared, x2 squared, x2 prime squared. Okay. Plus, now this is where the convenience of the root 2. Plus uh, square root of 2 times square root of 2 is just 2. So we get plus 2 x1, x2, x1 prime, x2 prime. x1, x2, x1 prime, x2 prime. Okay. Now, I leave it to you to do the algebra to show that this is exactly equal to. Okay. This is exactly equal to. X one X one prime plus X two X two prime plus one half squared minus one fourth. Okay, so let's see. So X one X one prime squared gives me x1 squared, x1 prime squared, okay? x2, x2 prime squared gives me x2 squared, x2 prime squared, okay? 1 half squared gives me 1 fourth minus 1 fourth, so that'll disappear, okay? Now let's look at the cross terms. There's the cross term that involves x1, x1 prime times a half times 2, so that's just x1, x1 prime, boom. There's a cross term that involves x2, x2 prime times a half times 2, so that's just x2, x2 prime. And there's one more cross term, which is this guy times this guy times 2, which is exactly that guy. Okay. And so this is equal to x dotted into x prime. So that's that term, with plus 1 half squared minus 1 4. Okay. Wow. Okay. So this dot product in the z space is equal to this function in my x space. So if I wanted to compute dot products in my z space, I can take my x values, my x vectors, and just compute this function. This is exactly what my kernel is going to be. Kernel of x and x prime. In other words, I have managed to represent the dot product in my z space using a function in my x space. And all I need to make this algorithm run are dot products in my z space. And I replace them by functions, by kernels, by, by the kernel of by the, by the kernel function of my data points in my x space. So I don't physically need the z. Okay. Now, just to illustrate, a side note, you could do this, you could do this comparable transform to the, the qth order polynomial, and you'll get a lot of terms here. Okay. And it turns out that you can, you can construct the transform so that the corresponding kernel is exactly x dot x prime plus one half to the power q, you know, you know, minus some constant c. Okay. And so this kernel corresponds to taking the inner product, the dot product of transformed vectors with respect to the qth order polynomial transform. Now, if you wanted to, you could actually transform, take the dot product, and it's going to be a humongous dot product. Okay. The, the complexity is rising quite rapidly with Q. Or you could stay in your X space, compute this kernel, which is equivalent to the dot product. 
And let's look at the runtime here. You take the dot product, that's just order of the dimensionality of my original space, which is two. It does not depend on the number of dimensions in my qth order space. So this is a quick operation, order of two. Now you raise this number to the power q. That's easy. And then you subtract a constant. This is essentially instant. Okay. Huge computational savings. Okay. While going into that space and performing the dot product physically is tedious, computationally intense. Okay. So this example illustrates two concepts. Well, the first, we can run this entire algorithm in this z space without visiting the z space by using this kernel which miraculously computes this dot product. And all I need is to be able to miraculously compute dot products to run that algorithm. The second thing it, it, it illustrates, the second concept is, wow, look at the speed gain. This is essentially instant. This is going to be a rapidly costly, you know, inner product computation if I actually transform there, depending on the order of the polynomial. This is called the qth order polynomial kernel. Qth order polynomial kernel. So let me erase and show you this exact process, but now transforming me to an infinite dimensional space. Okay. And then the, the end of the idea is, okay, you know, look, in this particular example, I was able to sort of mathematically analyze the transform and construct the kernel. Okay. And in the next example, to infinite dimensional spaces, we're going to be able to mathematically analyze the transform and construct the kernel. Okay. But what if you cannot do that? Then you have no choice. You have to transform into that space. Okay. And that's where we play the game of we get to choose the space we want to transform to. So you choose a space to transform to for which there exists a kernel. Okay. And then we reverse the game. We say, you know what? I don't even want to choose the space to transform to. Can I just pick the kernel? and assume that there's some space that corresponds to that, and by and large, yes. Okay. It turns out that if this kernel satisfies the basic properties that an inner product should satisfy, that means that it is symmetric and positive, de positive definite, then it, any kernel that's symmetric and positive definite corresponds to some Z space. And now we don't even need to know the space we're going into. Okay. So that's the immense power of the kernel. But, you know, that having said that, let me come back and do this example to infinite dimensional spaces, and that gives us the ability to learn in infinite dimensional spaces. Wow! Okay. So, transforming to infinite dimensions. Learning in infinite dimensions. Where have you seen that before? Have you ever seen that? The ability to learn in infinite dimensions? Before we do the infinite dimensional example, let me just mention that everything we did was for separable data. It's very easy to accommodate non-separable data. Now, in the primal form, we said that what we're going to do is minimize uh, W transpose W one half, you know, plus the uh, margin penetration C sum from N equals one to big N of Cn. And the separation condition was that uh, Yn W transpose Xn plus B should be greater equal to one minus Cn. Okay. And C was the regularization parameter. It turns out that almost exactly the same um, uh, uh, dual algorithm works with the same inner product property. Okay. The only difference is that the constraint on alpha n becomes C greater equal to alpha n greater equal to zero. So this, this regularization constant C come, becomes an upper bound on the alpha n. And then the definition of a support vector is not just that it must be greater than zero, so a support vector must be greater than zero and must be at most C. So, in other words, you know, the constraint, none of the constraints are saturated. That makes it a support vector and exactly the same. So that's a bit, almost a non-change, almost a non-change. So you can do non-separable data by introducing the soft margin, okay, and the optimization problem in the dual space hardly changes, okay? So that's just a quick note about non-separable data, non-linearly separable data. You can use the soft margin hyperplane. Okay, so let's get back and do this infinite dimensional example, and then we're done. Okay, so consider the following transform into an infinite dimensional space. You can think of this as an uh, infinite order polynomial transform. So x goes to e to the minus x squared. Okay, and now I'm going to do, you know, basically x to the 0, x to the 1, x to the 2, x to the 3, x to the 4, da 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 da, going on forever. So 
infinite dimensional polynomial transform. Well, the algebra is going to get messy. So I'm going to insert some constants into these that make things a little bit more manageable. So I'm going to put a square root of 2 to the 0 um, over 0 factorial. Okay, A square root of 2 to the 1 over 1 factorial. A square root of 2 to the 2 over 2 factorial. A square root of 2 to the 3 over 3 factorial, and so on. You get the idea. The kth order power, x to the k, will have a square root of 2 to the k over k factorial. Okay, so, wow! You should be looking at me and saying, are you crazy? Okay, you're going to go and transform into this infinite dimensional uh, polynomial space. It's not possible. Yes, we will never have to physically do that. That's the whole point. That's the game in town. Okay, that's the miracle. Okay, so, so this is z. Okay, so this is z. Let's consider what happens if I have another vector, x prime. This, this uh, goes to e to the minus x prime squared. Okay, uh, square root of 2 to the 0 over 0 factorial x prime to the 0. Square root of 2 to the 1 over 1 factorial x prime to the 1, and so on. Square root of 2 to the k over k factorial x prime to the k. Okay, so this is z prime. And if I were actually to go into this space and compute the dot product, okay, z dotted into z prime is equal to uh, e to the minus x squared, e to the minus x prime squared. These turn out to be important. That normalizes this whole thing. Okay, It keeps this under control. Otherwise, it's blowing up. Okay, So this e to the minus x squared, e to the minus x prime squared, I'm taking the dot product. So this times this, Okay, times... Okay. The component-wise multiplication, and then you add the dot product. Okay, so this times this. That's the beauty of this square root square root term. They, the square roots disappear. So I get two to the zero over zero factorial x x prime to the zero. So x x prime to the zero plus two to the one over one factorial over one factorial. The square roots cancel. X x prime to the one plus two to the two over two factorial x x prime to the two plus da 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 da, -da going on forever. Ah, but. We are all experts at analysis, and we notice that this here, this infinite sum is always convergent, and it actually converts. So this is, you know, uh, this is, we can put the 2 to the 0 in here. So let me make this 2xx prime. 2 to the 1 can be brought in here. So let me make this 2xx prime. 2 to the 2 can be brought in here. So let me make this 2xx prime. So you have something to the 0 over 0 factorial, something to the 1 over 1 factorial, something to the 2 over 2 factorial, adding it all up. What is that? I'll give you a couple of seconds. We know that sum. It's a famous sum. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. I hope you all said this is just e to the 2x x prime. So this is e to the minus x squared minus uh, times e to the minus x prime squared times e to the 2x x prime. Well, from basic high school algebra, this is just e to the minus of x minus x prime squared. What a simple function. What? A simple function in my one-dimensional space. So this is a one-dimensional x. What a simple function in my one-dimensional space that computes the dot product in this infinite dimensional space. This is allowing me to perform learning with infinite order polynomials. Wow. This is called the Gaussian kernel. And so, like I said, the game we play is, you know, well, you know, ideally we would like to say, let's construct a feature transform and the corresponding kernel. Usually that's the wrong way to go about it. Sketching your nose the wrong way around your head. I can't do it. Okay, we don't do it that way. Usually what we do is we say, well, you know, let's just dream up a kernel. I'm sure it corresponds to some z space. And I don't need to know the z space because why do I need to know the z space? I can do the entire algorithm without ever going there. That's the beauty. So with this kernel, I can do infinite dimensional polynomial regression. This is called the Gaussian kernel. It, it computes a, a, a dot product in an infinite dimensional polynomial transformed space. Okay, the general version of this, so this is for one dimension, the general version of this Gaussian kernel is, uh, so k of x, x prime, k of x, x prime, the kernel that gives us the dot product in my z space is, you know, in this case, it's e to the minus x minus x prime squared. Okay. And the general Gaussian kernel 
the k of if these are vectors in some original d-dimensional space, x, x prime, is equal to e to the minus. We allow a gamma term, a gamma factor, you can multiply by a constant. Okay, the distance between x and x prime squared. This is a special case of that distance. Okay. So this is the Gaussian kernel. It corresponds to the inner product in some space. Okay. And using this kernel to replace the dot products in the uh, optimal hyperplane algorithm, which was only possible because we spent all that effort to go into the dual space and recognize that that algorithm only depends on inner products. Wow! Okay, that's the power that it has opened up. That's the world that it has opened up. The ability to now forget about that uh, feature transform space and simulate it with a kernel. It's all that's going on here. And we have lots of kernels now, and we sometimes don't even know what feature space it corresponds to. We can just prove that it corresponds to a feature space. So there's a theorem called Mercer's theorem, which says that as long as you dream up any kernel you want that's symmetric, so if you flip x and x prime, you get the same value, and it's positive definite. Okay, so you need to know what positive definite means for functions of two variables. Basically, it corresponds to the fact that this kernel matrix, this gram matrix that is defined, is always a positive definite matrix, okay, no matter what the data points are. Okay. So as long as your kernel guarantees those two properties, it does correspond to some uh, feature transform space. I don't know what it is, but who cares? Okay. So let's summarize. And this is a real miracle. We can do learning in infinite dimensional spaces now. <laughs> infinite dimensional spaces. Okay. Summary. It's computationally feasible to learn in infinite dimensional spaces. It's computationally feasible to learn in infinite dimensional spaces. Okay, and what's the idea here? That's because we have the kernel, which takes two arguments in your original space and gives you the dot product in your feature transform space. And the ability to compute dot products in your feature transform space is the only thing you need to run the optimal hyperplane algorithm in that space and even produce the classifier that runs in that space. The classifier also only needs the ability to compute dot products. And the kernel is this magic mechanism that allows us to compute that dot product. Okay. And we all know that if you go and learn in infinite dimensional spaces, okay, you had better watch out because it's non-falsifiable. You'll always be able to separate the data. So you'll always be able to separate the data. Okay. In other words, you've lost all control between E in and E out. And so you have to regularize like heck. Okay, so you have to regularize, regularize. And that's where we come full circle. That's the beauty of the optimal hyperplane. It's a, it maximally regularizes. It's the max margin. Okay. So the only thing that allows us to get away with jumping into this infinite dimensional space is if, you know, the, the maximum margin constrains you enough. So even though you, you technically have the ability to do arbitrarily complex separators, you have to regularize and, 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 and get this maximum margin guy. And effectively, if the number of support vectors is small, that means you've effectively used a few degrees of freedom, even though you had infinitely many. And so if you've effectively used a few degrees of freedom, that is what brings E in and the E out issue back into perspective, brings it under control. And, and that's because we, we can control E out with uh, uh, parameters that are not directly linked to the dimensionality of the space. So this will be okay. So we, we survive when number of support vectors is small. So even though you started with huge capability, you only use a very small amount of that capability. Okay. So Two things needed to come together, and they both come together with the optimal hyperplane. What are those two things? It has to be computationally feasible 
to go into infinite space, in infinite dimensional spaces. You can, it's computationally feasible as long as you have an inner product algorithm. And you know, this happens to be an inner product algorithm. And any inner product algorithm can be so-called kernelized. Okay. But that alone is not enough. Okay. That just, you know, allows us to go into a huge dimensional space and efficiently perform the learning. Doesn't mean that the learning will work. For the learning to work, you have to have this maximum margin, this maximum regularization. You have to not use all that power, even though it's available. Use only the power you need. Okay. Become maximally robust to measurement error. Okay. And so I hope that I've given you a flavor for how powerful the optimal hyperplane is. And what is the optimal hyperplane? It's just a hyperplane. It's a linear model. Didn't I say the linear model is so powerful? Watch out for the linear model. If you cannot solve your problem with a linear model, you haven't thought enough about the problem, but now we've given you the nonlinear feature transform and we've even given you feature transforms into infinite dimensions with the ability to control. You don't need much more. Checking out. <laughs>